but, but before I kind of start, the one thing I'd like to do is kind of thank you all for taking the time to listen to this talk, because when you come to these kind of events, you expect to talk about mobile, and we just saw an amazing example from Sanofi. You expect to talk about closing marketing, compliance, and those kind of things. There's some great presentations this morning. And perhaps what you wouldn't expect is necessarily to talk about gamification. And what both myself and Andy, who's going to follow me, are going to do, hopefully, over the next hour, is really kind of show you what we can learn from gamification, what it can actually mean to kind of healthcare. I also kind of want to apologize for some of these graphics. When I was putting the presentation together, it was the Olympics. We'd won a bag full of gold medals, and I was feeling quite great. And obviously, now it's September. It's a little bit bleak. So I do apologize for the, uh, for the patriotism. Um, so first of all, I'm going to tell you about the scenario and kind of where we are at the moment. And we all spend a lot of time, effort, and money. And we come up with some great strategies and some really good creatives. And we do all this to really kind of drive traffic to our online service. And we're incredibly successful, and we're very proud of what we do. And we talk about things like we get 10,000 visitors a week, or we get a million visitors a year. And it's, it's, it's a really great story, and we're really proud of it. One of the challenges that we sometimes face is when someone goes, and how many repeat visitors do you get? How many people go to more than two pages? And they're sometimes more difficult questions to answer, because ultimately, what tends to happen with some of our websites and our online service is that our visitors kind of go away. And one of the things that I really want to focus on for the next half an hour is what I would call like sustained engagement. So it's how we put all the effort into driving traffic. It's how we make, make sure we maintain, maintain that level of interest. Now, one of the first things to note about gamification is that I personally hate the expression. I think it, it somewhat undervalues um, some really solid principles in really trying to engage with users and deliver our messages in the most compelling way that we can. When we're talking about gamification, what we're not talking about is taking complex clinical data and turning it into a game. We're also absolutely not talking about um, you know, trivializing serious and, and, and you know, life debilitating conditions. What we're talking about doing is looking at what makes games engaging, great, and taking some of those best bits, taking some of those ideas and concepts and applying them to our online service to make it more engaging. So what I'm definitely not going to do is I'm not going to talk about Mario. I'm going to be talking more about what it kind of means to healthcare. But before I do that, I just want you to take on board a couple of little points. Is this is absolutely not just about digital. And I'm going to show you a few examples where gamification is applied to very mundane tasks to make them that little bit more engaging. It's also kind of not new. We've been doing gamification for years. And when I was putting this together, I was thinking about it. And you know, I used to get to do the dishes for my parents. And they'd say things like, will you go and do the dishes? And I'd say, like, no. And then they'd say, but I bet you can't do it as well as you did it last night. And I'd go, OK, I'll show you, I'll show you can do the dishes. And it, it's those little things about making things into challenges so, so we can make it more engaging. And as I say, it's not about building games. So a couple of examples of gamification outside of digital, but there's a few key le lessons to learn. The light's not great here, but that's meant to be a coupon. Now, my mum is pretty active in reading the newspapers and looking for those coupons, and she cuts them, cuts them out, and she runs to the superstore, and she kind of uses them. And really, you think about shopping, and it's, it's not that enjoyable. But by using this kind of principles, it suddenly became, becomes much more interesting. I drink loads of coffee, and I don't consider it to be a game when I'm actually collecting my stamps, so I get my free mug of coffee from Starbucks. But again, it's making it more interesting. Loyalty cards, another great example of how we reward participation and encourage people to continue to use our services. And my personal favorite, happy hour, which is bringing people together at an actual particular point to try and make it work. So that's all very well and good, and that's you know, uh, gamification outside of digital. But what is gamification? Gamification is all about taking your service and trying to engage with a user. So we want to think about the design. We want to think about the user interface. We want it to be uh, simple to use, pick up and play, really engaging. We also want to think about how can we make it rewarding? How can we make it competitive? How can we kind of set goals? And also, how can we reward progression? How can we make it feel like you're achieving something? And pulling these all together, we then ultimately have, hopefully, a more engaged, engaged user. So you'd probably be expecting me to talk about the technology behind it. But as you say, gamification is not about technology. It's much more about the principles to deliver better online experiences. So why does that kind of work? The first is like challenging. You know, we all kind of watch the Olympics and loads of people, you know, hit the streets to go jogging. They went swimming. They went walking. And everyone always wants to beat their personal best. They want to run further. They want to run faster. They want to swim for longer. And it's those principles that we need to think about. 
competition, if we all, if I went for a run now on my own, I'd probably, you know, be very slow. But if I was running against all you guys in this room, I'd probably run a bit quicker because we like competition. It what makes us kind of tick. And ultimately winning, you know, right from an early age, we want to win, whether it's playing football on a Saturday morning, whether it's academically, whether it's trivial pursuits or a pub quiz, we want to kind of win and it really engages with us. And for me, completion is probably the easiest one. I've got a great example of this later. I live my life by like lists. Every morning I write a new list and as I'm going through the day, I like tick things off. It's a very small thing, but it makes a big difference. It keeps me engaged in what I'm doing. So it doesn't have to be complicated, but I like that, that concept of completing things. So one of the things that I really want you to take away is that to deliver a great online experience, you've really got to consider offline behavior, try and bring those two things together. That's absolutely key. Okay, so it all sounds really good, but what are the techniques that you can take away and apply in healthcare to your projects to deliver better online services? The first one is goals. And I desperately wanted to not talk about computer games, but I'm going to in this one instance. I used to play loads and loads of Mario, which is a really big, uh, big game. And it basically, it was made up of like eight worlds with four levels in each. And it was pretty tough. Now, after every world, you got to beat a baddie. And it kept you entertained. And they were little baddies. And as you built up through the little baddies, you eventually got to the end of the big baddie who you could kill. If they hadn't have existed, I would never have got to the end of the game. But because they were like short, middle, long-term goals, it kept me going all the way through. And I think we have to really think about, you know, we know what the ultimate goal is for the user, but how do we get them there in like small steps? How do we really develop a great user experience? And this is an example of where we've done that. And actually, uh, one of my friend's colleagues is going to talk about this later. And it's, it's a campaign for, for schizophrenia, and it's part of Schizophrenia 24-7. It's pretty successful. It's had 250,000 visitors. And I hope you're all thinking, yeah, but have you had repeat visitors or you know, more than two visits? And what I can tell you is it has a 20% goal completion record. So one of five people that come to our website, of those 250,000, complete a goal. Now, for me personally, I go to hundreds of websites, and there's very few where I actually actively participate. What was clever about this is it allowed, this was for, um, say, it's for schizophrenia. It's called Getting Better App. And we want patients to, um, to help manage their own condition. And we want them to set their own goals, small achievable goals that they can do that will help them to get better, be it in relationships, how they look, or staying calm. So here we've got the goals, and we can see how often they're completing it. And then we encourage them that once they've done the smaller goals, we'll set them bigger goals and more goals. And we're going to keep moving them along. And all the way along this service, we're going to keep um, encouraging them, providing top tips, and really try and keep them engaged and go for that sustained, sustained approach. And then as well, we're going to start to give them rewards. So if they want to start to tailor their online experience and, and design this room and choose the different furniture, they can do. So we're bringing a few of these different things together. The next example is uh, progression. And I think this is important, and it goes back to my little tick, my, my ticks. Um, you know, we're all so incredibly busy that we always want to feel like we're getting somewhere and we're actually doing something. And I think the same is absolutely true when you're online. You want to feel like you're working through things. So I found a brilliant example, and I never expected to be stood up in front of you talking about gamification and showing you LinkedIn, which I don't think could be further removed from a computer game if you tried. I was using LinkedIn um, about three months ago, and I was uh, filling in my profile, and you know, quite quickly I got to like 75%. And I looked at the next 25%, and it was completely irrelevant to me. It really wasn't of any value. Um, but I didn't want to leave it uncompleted. I thought it was a bad reflection on me. I, I, you know, I wanted it to be finished. So it's a very clever way of doing it. And here, if we look at one of our designers that hopefully isn't using LinkedIn for a new job, um, here, here we can see that they've completed 45% of their profile. Now, that's quite interesting, because 55% is still, is still a lot to do, and probably a little bit intimidating or overwhelming. But because LinkedIn are really smart, they then break that 55% down into like different modules. So here we've got add another position for 15%. Well, I'll probably do. I probably will add another position for 15% because it's, it's not that much. And quite quickly, I'll probably get up to the point where I have 100%. But then because LinkedIn are brilliant when it comes to gamification and the principles, what they also have is here's one of your co uh, colleagues who's got a top profile. So they have done 100%. So again, it's using that competitive element to encourage you to complete forms. It's a good example. 
The next is about competition, and it's not really competition for the sake of it. It's all about knowing the customers and coming up with a competition that's absolutely relevant to them, something that they are going to succeed in, something that they're going to want to do and come back and do. And it's a really good way, if you get it right, of encouraging repeat users and ultimately building a community. So here's an example of um, a, a, this is a game that we created a few years ago. And this was for um, hospital specialists, and it was for people treating hospital-acquired infections. And what we did with this is there was loads of science. So I'm pretty good at space invaders, but I couldn't complete this game. And the whole principle was that, that when um, a user, and this was online, and it was at conference, when they came to this, they got a very, very detailed background on the patient. They found all about their, their clinical history. Based on that information, they didn't have to choose the most appropriate antibiotic. If they choose the right one, they can treat and cure the patient. If they choose the one, wrong one, his health degrades much quicker and we have a, a negative outcome. But it's a really nice example of where you've taken some really great clinical data, some really good learning, and delivered something that makes a real difference. And we were pleased that this actually went viral in terms of getting into medical schools and been shared by, by students across those, so, so successful. The other thing that's a key thing to bear in mind is collaboration. And collaboration communities doesn't mean you always need to have comments. You know, there's other ways of doing this. There's smart ways of doing this. And the point I started to think about is that, you know, when we do pub quizzes, we like being part of a team because we like working together to kind of solve problems. And it's taking some of these ideas and, and building it into what you're doing. This is another great example of gamification, and it's horrifically designed, and I apologize for that, but it's a great user experience. Now, I use Yahoo Answers, and I'm sure loads of people do in here. The thing about Yahoo Answers is you always get back, A, the first answer, or B, the most viewed answer, which is usually the first answer. And after looking at about three answers, I tend to get really bored. What these really smart people did on this website called Stack Overflow is they started to rate answers, and they started to curate answers. So very, very quickly, the best answers was the first answer you got, which is a much better experience. And it's something very, very simple. But I guess the question is, what would that potentially mean to healthcare? So, you know, for me, it's a great way to drive better healthcare professional networks because it's a much better experience. But also, quite interestingly, as we start to rate people's answers and their own profile, we start to build up their status. And in many ways, we could start to look at shaping the key opinion leaders of the future. But I also think, and to some of the talks earlier this morning that Nick was talking about, I think it really helps to build transparency and credibility because it's not necessarily what we want to be at the top, but it's what the community wants to be at the top, which is obviously going to deliver a more worthwhile experience. And then, obviously, there's a Blue Peter badge, and literally, I would have done anything for a Blue Peter badge. And when you think about it, it's a bit bizarre, because you can't really play with it, you can't really sell it, but you really want it. You know? And this is why shiny prizes aren't always the best. You know, we could all offer to give away a car, we'd get in loads of trouble with Heather, but we could and we'd probably get a million people to our website, they would register and they would leave immediately. And what we're looking for is this sustained engagement. So it's about coming up with, with rewards that actually are relevant and work. And an amazing example is eBay. So my brother-in-law's on eBay, he sells loads of things, and he does anything to get that little red star, because that little red star means that he's had a 1,000 positive reviews, and that's his reward for delivering a great service. And that little red star empowers him to keep using this service and going further. So again, it doesn't have to be a holiday. It can be something really in line with what we're doing. So what we have a tendency to do is we have a tendency to look at what other people are doing and see what we can learn. So I've just got a couple of case studies that I'm going to show you and then talk about perhaps what that would mean for healthcare. One is in healthcare, one is out. So just for you to have a look at. The first one is Nike Plus, which is quite frankly brilliant. Runner, huh? Fantastic. Well, if you like running, you're going to love running with Nike Plus. Picture yourself out on a run. With Nike Plus, that run becomes an endless parade of information about you. How fast you're going, how far you've gone, how long you've been at it, how many calories you've burned, it's all there, which is awesome on its own. But when you download that run to Nike Plus, you get your doors blown off. You'll see every run you've ever done. All the details, the whole enchilada. Pull up maps of your runs. You'll know exactly where you got lost. Got any friends? Awesome, put them to work. They can cheer you on while you're running by posting comments to your Facebook page. Better yet, challenge them. If they're really your friends, they'll still talk to you while they're choking on your dust. Nike Plus recognizes and rewards you for your efforts. I'm Allison Felix. 
Congratulations on your fastest 5K ever. And when you're ready for your next challenge, Nike Plus will take care of that too. It'll create a training program for you and help you stay on the path to victory. See what I mean? Doors blown off. Now go grab your shoes, get yourself some Nike Plus, and let's get out there. So when I was writing this presentation and I did my research and found out about Nike Plus, I thought it was amazing, went out and bought a Nike Plus and started doing some running. So it's, it's a really good example. But I know what you're all thinking is, that's great, they've got multi-multi-million pound budgets and they don't work in a heavily regulated industry like we do. But that doesn't mean that we can't take some of the principles and apply it to what we're doing. So, you know, for me, why does it work? Most importantly, it's pick up and play. So it's instantly easy to use and it's instantly rewarding. And I think where Nike absolutely nailed it is in terms of the goals. So they're tough, but they're achievable, and they're broken down into really, really small steps, and it keeps you engaged, it doesn't overwhelm you. I also think the integration between the online and the offline experience, to my point earlier, is absolutely flawless. They just are one and the same, there is no difference. And ultimately, what they're, what they're doing is making running, which can be boring, uh, much more engaging, and, you know, as I'm not really a fan of running, and I figure if you can make that engaging, then online we should be able to do loads of great things. So literally, you know, what could we do in healthcare? And it's interesting when you look at, you know, Jason's presentation before and you think about what the future that might look, and then you look at what maybe Nike are doing, and it's really quite exciting. For me, like physical well-being, you know, whether it's running, exercising, or stretching, you know, it's allowing patients perhaps to monitor their progress and see what it's doing to them. Same with adherence, they're taking the pill, so let's let them know the benefit it's delivering, let's keep them motivated and have those small goals. I think community sport's a really big thing. I like the idea of bringing you know, patients and peers together, them setting their goals and sharing if they're successful or encouraging each other on and working together. It's really quite interesting. Uh, the next case study I'm going to show you is, interestingly, for diabetes, uh, but this is in healthcare. And the one thing that I'd really like you to think about when you look at this is the fact that they're talking about diabetes, but they're completely focused on the user. They're absolutely focused. And you'll see what I mean when you look at the tone. And it's really important. Welcome to Sister Match, a program designed to connect women living with diabetes with a peer support network. Sister Match is part of Diabetes Sisters, a non-profit group dedicated to helping women with diabetes thrive in their everyday lives. Sister Match is a nurturing space for creating meaningful connections. Using the metaphor of a living quilt, this space weaves sisters, their stories, opinions and activities together into a tapestry of experiences. By blending a comprehensive matchmaking algorithm with the play and engagement of social games, Sister Match aims to bring like-minded women together for support, mentorship, and knowledge exchange in new, meaningful ways. The matchmaking algorithm dives into a participant's attitudes, personality, and preferences via real-world challenges, knowledge tests, and quizzes, then delivers each sister her best sister matches. Using this matchmaking process, Women with diabetes will be able to build a list of compatible peer support friends and begin new friendships. Sister Match provides Diabetes Sisters members with a unique way to find and connect with other women. Participating in Sister Match is easy. If you're already logged into your Diabetes Sisters account, simply click on the login button to continue. If you're not already a Diabetes Sisters member, you'll need an account to participate in Sister Match. Just in terms of, of why it works, and I think it's really important, is I feel like it's really sympathetic to the target user group. So they've obviously spent time thinking about who the users are and actually what makes them tick. They may want to make it look like diabetes, they may want to look like clinical, they may want to make it look pharma, but they haven't. They've designed an experience absolutely in line with the user group. I also think um, they've done incredibly well to build loyal users, because with loyal users you have sustained engagement. And they made a decision to make it a closed community. And by making it a closed community, it will never attract as many visitors as if it was an open community. But by doing that, they have people to deliver personal stories. Um, and I just think it's a really nice example of going, we don't necessarily need everyone, we just need our target audience, and we'll deliver a great experience for those guys. I also like the fact that it uses personality match, which is usually the domain of online dating, so I thought that was good. Okay, so what does kind of gamification mean for healthcare? 
What it absolutely does not mean that we take complex clinical data, to my earlier point, and turn it into a game. It completely doesn't mean that we take serious conditions and we make them trivial. And sadly, for everyone in this room who thought they were going to get to do Mario, it doesn't mean we all become like game developers. What it means is we look at what makes games engaging, what makes, um, makes them work, those ideas, those concepts, and we apply them to everything we're doing from an online point of view to ultimately deliver a much better online experience, which is much more sustained. And then really what I kind of want you to start thinking about is when we have that decision to make and how we're doing with budget, and I'm sorry you might not be able to see all this, we think about progression. So we think about when they come to our website, how do they progress through it? And not just for our goals, but for their goals. What are they going to get out of this? And we think about collaboration. As I say, it doesn't mean people have to suddenly have comments and we don't always have to like moderate this stuff. There are much simpler and easier ways to encourage collaboration. And we think about rewards, and it's not a reward that looks like a car. It's a reward that's absolutely in keeping with your target audience that they will benefit from. And then, ultimately, my point is that perhaps if we're going to deliver a better online experience, we can maybe be more targeted in how we drive that traffic to our site, because we're less interested in the total number that come and much more interested in the goals completion and what we're getting from it. Sadly, there'll always be people who probably don't do this and they just move on, but that's life. So I've just got a couple of slides to kind of finish with. Um, first of all, you know, when you do this, it's all about doing it right. So absolutely understand what makes your customers tick. And I don't mean by that they want to know about safety or they want to know about tolerability. You know, find out more about them outside of what your particular interest is. How do they behave offline? What can we learn about it? What makes them tick? Um, also, you know, we all have our you know, brand objections, and that's completely right. But we also really need to think about what the actual visitor wants and make sure that what we're trying to achieve and what they're trying to achieve comes together so it's a true partnership. And let's make sure that if we do kind of set goals and we do think about that, let's not be challenging. I know we want to get them to here as soon as we possibly can, but perhaps we have to do it in maybe some small steps and keep them engaged. And if we're doing all this, then let's make sure that we capture some really, really valuable, valuable insight from the customer which I could happily talk about for the next few hours, but I'm not going to. But then there's ways of doing it wrong. And I guess the thing to think about here is sometimes there's not scope to make this work. And if there's not scope to make it work, please, please don't do it, because it'll feel contrived. It'll feel forced, and ultimately, you'll lack engagement. And also, genuinely, you're not here to make games. So only do this if it's completely aligned with your brand strategy. You know, that is the most important thing. And if you're going to distract from your message, your story, then perhaps it's not right. So a very, very smart guy called uh, Gabe Zickerman um, came up with these six rules of gamification. And I thought I'd kind of leave you with this, really. And really, he says, like, understand what constitutes a win. And it's not a win for you. It's a win for them. Understand the user's motivation and really genuinely what makes them tick, not the fact they want to come and find out a particular piece of information. And make sure you're designing it for them and not necessarily for you. So let's really think about what's going to work for them. And if we do rewards, let's not just go, OK, they've done this, we'll give them a star. But what does that look like if they keep coming back? So really think about, you know, I remember being at school getting like one gold star or three gold stars or five gold stars. You know, it's important to make it kind of scalable. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. We've been doing this for years. We probably all do it without even knowing we do. And make every single interaction count, every single one. So before I take questions, these are some of the questions that I thought you could think about before you decide whether you, know, you want to sort of incorporate this kind of stuff. Most importantly, does it fit with your brand objectives? Because if it doesn't, don't do it. Um, is it appropriate for my content? Again, if it's not, don't do it. Um, will it compromise my content? Again, really think about that carefully. And then ultimately, think about at the outset, how can I measure success? And it's actually really simple to do because we all have a couple of websites where people sometimes go a bit too soon. So now it's questions for me. Jamie, thanks very much. That's very interesting. <clears throat> I mean, gamification is a hot topic in the pharma industry, so I'm hoping that you're going to have some questions for David. Does anybody have a question? While you're thinking about it, could I ask you one? I mean, one of the things, David, that you, you said here was that gamification won't work unless you actually understand your target audience pretty well. Do you find that those clients of yours who buy into gamification put more time and effort in up front to try and understand the target audience than if they weren't looking at gamification? Um, 
around that, I think there's like a, a really important point. Um, when we talk to people about ward invaders as an example, uh, the, the default response is, but that won't work for all the target audience. You know, not everyone is going to want to play ward invaders to learn necessarily about antibiotics. But my point to that is we do a marketing mix, and we do a marketing mix for a reason. We do that because different people like content in different ways. So this isn't going to work for all of your target audience, but it's about understanding your target audience and then designing the right communications plan to address each different group. So it's really making segmentation and targeting yeah. much more real for people. You've got to really understand who you're talking to to make this work. Great. I mean, are you able to tell us how many or what proportion of your clients at the moment are actually looking at gamification and trying to weave it into their projects? Okay, so I guess the point that I was trying to make throughout all this is it's not about, to my first slide, about making kind of Mario. So whoever you're all working with, their agency should absolutely be thinking about this across every digital activity because they're very simple principles that just make a really big difference. So all our clients, probably very few of them would say we're doing gamification. My mum certainly wouldn't think she's doing gamification when she gets the coupons, but we are because it's just great design to deliver great user experience across all digital activity. Yeah, that's interesting. Does anybody have a question for David? Now, I'm going to ask a question of the digital guys because our next speakers are asking to do something quite technically complex. Are we ready to introduce the next speakers? Ah, fantastic. So, David, thank you very much. Thank you.